Uh, Mr. Speaker, if you take a look at the content of the motion that's uh, before the House, it asks something that's pretty simple. And that is, before you close down uh, the prison farm program, uh, a farm program that has provided uh, invaluable uh, effort to rehabilitate inmates uh, over the last hundred years, that the government should provide some modicum of, uh, of evidence uh, that, it, in fact, this program wasn't working. Uh, in committee, I think it was fairly startling to learn that Corrections Canada is keeping no statistics when it came, comes to the, uh, the, the effective rehabilitation of inmates who complete programs. They also keep no statistics on uh, whether or not those individuals were able to give job, get jobs when they were released. Uh, further, they keep no statistics um, uh, even on the costing of the program. Uh, they refused throughout uh, the debate and committee to provide what exactly was the cost of the prison farm program and how much money we would specifically save. Uh, and this motion asks uh, that before the government move forward, uh, that in each of those areas they demonstrably demonstrate uh, that the program wasn't effective. Uh, and here's the reason, Mr. Speaker. As, as I and uh, our critic for agriculture had the opportunity to travel the country, uh, we came to see uh, really the most effective program that we have in corrections at helping inmates rehabilitate. At the end of their sentence, just before they're about to be released, Inmates have given the opportunity to work in the prison farm program. It's a program that lets them work with animals, develop a empathy, uh, that lets them build the compassion that comes with working from a, with another living thing. And as we've seen in research from other jurisdictions, this type of work is now on the leading edge of making sure that when inmates are released, they don't reoffend. And at the bottom line, isn't that what public safety really is all about? Making sure that crimes don't happen either in the first place or in this case when somebody's being released from prison that it doesn't happen again. I had the opportunity to meet with the men who went through the prison farm program, to look into their eyes and see the difference it made in their lives, Mr. Speaker, how transformational it was. I heard from, uh, from a gentleman uh, who was in a terrible situation. No one can excuse his crime, but it was not an easy situation. He was 19 years old. Uh, he had a step-parent who was uh, abusing his, his mother uh, and uh, through a confrontation that happened in a, uh, when, when alcohol was involved um, there was manslaughter. Uh, he took the life of the person who was abusing his mother. Uh, a crime he deeply regrets but a situation that was deeply regrettable. He talked about how the prison farm program uh, changed him as a person, uh, made him stronger. Not just how it built empathy but how the process of voluntarily, and understand that this program is voluntary, when somebody gets up at five in the morning and they go into a farm and they put in 10 hours of work and they get to know the dignity of, of a job well done, understand the structure of work. For somebody who never really had had that structure in their life before, it becomes transformative. So in so many different ways, uh, this individual was able to articulate how it made a difference in his life. And then I talked to correctional officials, people who've been working in the prison farms in many cases for longer than 30 years. It's them who told us that there is no more effective program in corrections than the prison farm program. That in, in every instance where I talked to a correctional official, they said when it came to the prison farm program, there wasn't a single incident, not one, of violent recidivism. It is absolutely stunning that this government would ax a program that's that effective. Its rationale, ostensibly, was uh, twofold. One, the cost. Well, let's look at the cost. This government is embarking on chasing after California, spending tens of billions of dollars on mega prisons, locking people up for longer and longer following a Republican model that leads to less safe communities and turns prisons into crime factories. And it turns them into crime factories specifically because people go in for crimes and instead of getting better, they face reduced or cut back programs. So they're willing to spend billions of dollars on all these new prisons. But when it comes to a program that's effective and it's proven to work, that's a model internationally, they don't got the dollars. And how much are we talking? Well, the government tells us it's $4 million. They won't give us a breakdown of that $4 million. They tell us that no one is being laid off as a result of these closures. They tell us that they're now going to have to go to market to buy the milk and to buy the eggs that the program now provides for Ontario, 
for Quebec, and for the Maritimes. And yet, they say that somehow there's a mysterious $4 million that they can't give us any, any information on to save. Well, even if it does save $4 million, that's two fake lakes. That's, a, that's barely more than a second of G20, G8 spending uh, in a weekend. Uh, it is a pittance compared to how else this government blows money. The second rationale, aside from cost, is that agriculture is a dead industry. If you can believe it, conservatives standing up, ministers saying that the agriculture is a dead end. We don't, people don't need to learn those skills. There's no future in it. I think a lot of Canadians would find that offensive. But it also misses a fundamental point. When I go and I visit prisons, and I have visited most federal penitentiaries in this country, and I go in and I go to a literacy program, as an example, Mr. Speaker, and I talk with those that are going through a literacy program. We don't expect that most of them will become writers, but we do understand that the basic skills of literacy are an essential component to getting a job and having a future. Similarly, when I go into a, a prison program that has inmates sew pockets onto uh, materials that are going to be used by our soldiers or, uh, or sweep floors, I don't say how many are going to get a job sewing pockets. I don't say how many are going to get a job sweeping floors. Instead, I say what base skills are they giving, giving them? Because for most inmates who haven't had the opportunity of the structure of work, the pride that comes in from putting in a full day's job, this type of experience is one that makes a huge difference. I can't help, Mr. Speaker, but, but also reflect upon uh, something the member of Mel Peck uh, uh, once said to me, and that's when he was visiting a prison farm and there was a, 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 a cow that was there that had foot rot, uh, that in normal circumstances would be put down. He reflected upon the fact that it was the inmates that came and said, don't kill this animal, protect it. They had come so close to this animal and built so much empathy through that process that they rallied around the animal, so they wanted to nurse it back to health to take care of it. I can't help but think, as somebody's just about to be released from prison, that that's the kind of person we want them to be when they walk out those doors. Let us remember that more than 90% of those that are going to go into prison come back out, and that shutting down programs like this is a travesty. But this is just the continuation of other things the government is doing. Take a look at the fact that the crime prevention budget has been cut by more than 70%. You have groups like, uh, uh, like the Boys and Girls Club or churches um, that have been providing services to youth, trying to get them to turn away from a dark path, trying to make sure they don't commit those crimes in the first place, that they don't wind up in prison. Conservatives have slashed money to those programs. Similarly, the Victims of Crime Initiative has seen a 42% slashing of its budget, a program that helps break cycles of violence and victimization because so often, the people who are committing crimes themselves have been victimized in their lives. And so by cutting funding there, the, the government is refusing to break that cycle of victimization that can so often happen. So the government is slashing from the things that stop crime, that keep communities safe, and is dumping more and more money into prisons with less and less programs. If that wasn't enough, the government has now announced it's going to violate international conventions for which Canada is a signatory, to proceed with double bunking. To say that double bunking, there's nothing wrong with it. Despite the fact that in many provincial facilities, double bunking is not only happening, uh, but it's becoming the norm. In some cases, triple bunking. I talked to uh, provincial correctional officials in some provinces where they're literally transforming the library into prison space. Inmates stepping, it's being stepped over by prison guards at night to count them. And you can say, as you see this, well, who cares? Stack them on top of each other, the Conservatives would say. Make the conditions as deplorable as you possibly can. The problem is they get out. And when people come out, and they come out of a system that's that broken, that has no focus on rehabilitation, that stacks them on top of each other and cuts all their programs, that never invested in them in the first place by cutting pre prevention programs and cutting programs that help victims, who do they think walks out that door? When I was in uh, St. John's, Newfoundland, and went to Her Majesty's Penitentiary, and took a look at the deplorable conditions that so many people with serious mental illness are also facing, 
Um, this point is just further illustrated. For this government, and as we dealt with it in public safety committee, they saw no problem with solitary confinement. They'll take inmates uh, who are suffering from mental health il illnesses and put them into isolation, where their condition degenerates, where they get much worse. Because our prisons aren't hospitals, they're kept there. Uh, and the, the disturbing thing, again, is they're just released onto the streets. And of course, because they're mentally ill and their condition has gotten even worse, and because this government puts no money into uh, proper facilities to help deal with those mental illnesses, um, we end up having high rates of recidivism. So where is all this leading? It's not as if this is all just conjecture on my part or the part of just about every expert in the country. The reality is this has been tried before. This cancelling effective programs, this building of mega prisons, double bunking, stuffing people in on each other. It was tried in places like California and other states in the United States. The result there, Madam Speaker, was that it sucked like a vacuum, money out of health care and education, sucked money away from, from uh, infrastructure and for helping those who were in need. And what it left is a recidivism rate in California that's over 70 percent. We need programs like the prison farm program, Madam Speaker. We've got to take action.